Hello, everyone. This is Alexis Hutchinson with the FYE Talks podcast, and welcome back. We're so glad to have you. We're talking about the Peace Corps today, and so I have a really special guest who um, spent quite a bit of time in the Peace Corps and is going to give us a little bit more information about it because it's something that a lot of you probably are not very aware of, much like myself. So take it away. Hey, I'm Susan Cooper. Um, I, I'm with the FYE program at the Elizabethtown Community and Technical College. And I served in the Peace Corps in the early 1980s in uh, Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. It's located about 10 degrees above the equator, uh, sort of below the um, Dakar and the Senegal, and then um, just above the Ivory Coast, and uh, it, uh, Ghana borders that country as does uh, Liberia. So uh, it's, a, it's a British colony. Uh, most of the countries in Africa were either British colonies or French colonies. So it was a British colony. So um, uh, even though it wasn't the language you heard the most often, English was supposed to be their official language. And then in, um, as opposed to say uh, the Senegal, which was a French colony. So when you would go to, to a French um, colony country, it would be, uh, French would be their supposedly official language. However, in Sierra Leone, there was, um, uh, 27 different tribes and each tribe had their tribal language. So the two main tribes in my country was the what they call Mindy and the Timbi. So there were like those were really the two main languages in the country but if you knew what they called Creo then most everybody in the country, if you would go to that village, they would understand enough Creole that you could communicate with them. So that's actually the language we learned when we went to the country was, uh, was Creole. So we, would, so we would be able to communicate because there just wasn't all that many in the country that really could speak very good English. Interesting. And so can you kind of explain what is the mission of the Peace Corps and then maybe what made you want to join the Peace Corps? Peace Corps came into being in, um, in the 1960s with under the uh, President um, Kennedy administration. And uh, it was, um, it came into being as sort of a foreign relation tool. And I still say to this day, it's the cheapest foreign relation tool that we have in the United States that we can use. And, and uh, that's sort of how it was born is to go over and help third world countries, uh, help teach them different, uh, different types of, of things such as, um, my job was to teach primary school teachers how to use native materials as visual aids in the classroom. That's what some bureaucrat from DC dreamed up in my job description, who had probably never been in Africa before, much less the country or the village that I was going to work in. So I did do some of that, but my main job uh, became community development, which was trying to write grants to get um, funds to build water wells and latrines because that was the biggest problem in the village where I was. So, so that's, that's kind of what some of why this came to being is to use it as a foreign relation tool and at the same time help these third world countries. Uh, I read about it during the Kennedy administration because the, uh, that family and that administration in particular is really the first one I can remember as a child. So uh, it just always intrigued me. Um, and I always I decided when I was a kid that I would do that one day. But I always thought it would be a time when I was retiring and then would go over as I retired from um, a career, whatever that career was going to be. 
And then it was a time in my life I thought, no, oh, this is a good time to do it now. So that's, I just did it. And I don't know, they probably still do to some extent, but, but in the, uh, in the seventies, eighties, those time frames, there were a lot of uh, recruiters on campuses across the country, uh, Peace Corps, returning Peace Corps volunteers that would help recruit for the Peace Corps. So that's where I first got the information was when I was in college over at Western and I picked up the information, but really didn't do anything with it, but didn't throw it away either. And then after teaching a couple of years in, um, in high school in Berea, Kentucky, I just decided that I decided that teaching was not something I wanted to do at the at the elementary or secondary level. Uh, I had gone on and already almost finished up my master's, and I just thought since there was a gap there, a time in between what I was doing and what I was getting ready to do uh, was a good time to go. So that's why I ended up. Uh, I was single at the time and I just realized at that point that it was going to be tough to do something like that once you had children, once you were married, all those sorts of things, too many life issues could get in the way. So I, um, I joined, uh, my first placement was in uh, Venezuela and I turned that down and I don't know why, but I had in my head all along that the country where I really wanted to go was in Africa. So um, my next placement was in Sierra Leone, which I accepted. So um, I left about uh, late December, about this time, uh, to go to about a week of training that took place in Philadelphia. And you learned a lot about the country and a lot of about Peace Corps and you got a lot of shots and vaccinations and all those kinds of things. And then, um, then we flew out of, uh, of Philadelphia to, D to New York and then from New York on over to, um, I think there was, I guess we went from New York to France and then from France on to Sierra Leone. Uh, then once we got in the country, we spent about eight weeks in a village together, which is a training site. And you um, you stayed in that village with your group. And there was probably, I don't know exact number, I can't remember, but probably around 20 of us that was in my group. And you learned, you, you had intensive training of, about the culture. Uh, you had language training every day, you worked with that. Uh, the food, all those kinds of things that took place in the training site. Usually, if you were going to get sick, you would get sick during that time frame. Uh, and several of us did. Uh, that's when I first had the case of malaria. It lasted for it was about a week, but two days, really um, high fever and delusional and stuff. So you you get through all that stuff and then you were, and once they got to know you better, the individuals running the training, which was mainly Americans from DC or, um, or the uh, head office there in Sierra Leone, the Peace Corps office in Sierra Leone, they would, they would match you to a site, a village within the country. And once the training was over, then we all went our separate ways into our different villages. And you would live in that village and work in the village. And that's when you actually got the assignment of what you would be doing uh, once you got to the village. So I lived in a village about, um, it, was a, it was actually about a mile off of the only paved road in the country. It was about, five miles from the second largest city in the country, which wasn't very large <laughs> at all. And then um, uh, one of my requests is, was to be near a Catholic church. So I lived about a mile and a half 
from um, a village that also had a Catholic church and um, uh, two priests were there that were from Ireland and another peace, there were two Peace Corps uh, volunteers that lived in that village and one of them, and then there was a couple of Canadian, what you call a CUSO, which was actually Peace Corps uh, from Canada. It was a, kind of the same kind of program that Canada sent over. And so there were some, some people close to me where that could speak English. So I could get to someone and, and uh, speak English pretty easily if I needed to. Many of the Peace Corps volunteers, there wasn't anyone very close to them at all that, that could speak English with them. So some of them, you know, that was what they said they wanted. You know, they wanted to be in the bush as far away from people and civilization as possible. And then they got sent there and, and they just, they ended up having to be what we called cycle backed out because they just went crazy. Um, I remember one of my friends, we went to Freetown, which was the largest city in the country. It's where the Peace Corps office was and you'd have to occasionally go in there and take care of business and stuff and or just get near um, semi normal type situations in terms of, or it's nothing normal, don't get me wrong, but semi normal um, where there's actually a restaurant where you could go in and get a hamburger. It didn't taste like a real hamburger, but, but or you had a hotel that none of us could afford, but at least you, it looked like a hotel. And, and so I remember going in one time and one of our, our, what we call classmates that went over with us, he was walking down. He'd been one of those in the bush real far out, wanted to be away from everybody and all this. He was walking down the street, just throwing up what would be dollar bills to us, but they were Leon's over there, just throwing them in the air as he was walking down the street. I mean, he just went crazy and they had to get him out of there. So is it just the isolation that does that? It's the isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to, I could always go into this village Jerhoon where, which was where the church was and where some other volunteers were and a Lebanese family that ran the um, kind of the store, so to speak, where you could get rice and, and a few things. Um, and he, he and I were really good friends. So I could always go in and talk to them, but, but there was a time period where they had a, an election over there that, um, we didn't get mail for like six weeks. We didn't get, uh, we couldn't travel anywhere. We were kind of confined to our village. I was able to get to that one village, but, um, not it didn't even do that often. And, um, and so, yeah, you felt pretty trapped because like I said, that election was going on, they were afraid of a coup and which there was, a, there ended up being a coup in that country about, about eight years, seven, eight years after I left the country. And there was a civil war that went on there for about 10 years and really there's, lots of destruction Man. in the country and stuff and a lot of people died and lost limbs and and so forth so um so yeah uh it's the isolation uh it's the not being able to communicate with anybody else that speaks your own language uh and just it, it just what it takes to survive in a country like that mm -hmm. So yeah, there were a lot of them that didn't make it. And, and then so there was one that got very sick, got hepatitis real bad, mm -hmm. and they had to be sent back. Um, you are, uh, you're exposed to a lot of different things, not just the malaria. And even though you take the shots and everything, um, dysentery, of course, is the biggest thing that that most people would find just the eating the food and all the germs and stuff that come along with them. Yeah. I didn't ever, I never had that too bad, but I did have malaria once, but also 
um, was really careful about, I didn't want to get sick over there because there was no medical facility. The, the one hospital that, that was a long, hard drive to get to, it wasn't much of a hospital. So, so I did everything I could do not to get sick over there because that would have been scary. Yeah, well, and you, you think about all the different things that people take for granted, you know, that urgent care is open, it's well staffed, it's, you know, well supplied, things like that. It's just, I can see how that would, you know, just that fear and that paranoia would really weigh on you. Yeah, well, and of course you were, you were, I was young at the time, I was 24. Uh, when I went in or when I went over there. Um, we had our Peace Corps doctor there, but I mean, he was, you know, he was also a long way from from a lot of us. So, so we had him that we kind of relied on. We had the regular shots and, and uh, medicine that we took for the water and we always had to treat the water, boil the water, all that kind of stuff. So we did all those things. Some if some of the Peace Corps, some of the guys thought they were, you know, too tough to do that and they weren't going to do it, kind of like wearing a mask today. Mm -hmm. uh, they think it's really cool not to or think that they're showing their manhood by not refusing to. And they were the ones that would get sick because they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, so and then they paid for it big time. So. Yeah, just uh, like today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So. So yeah, uh, probably the hardest thing with the Peace Corps is um, is just being able to survive the the uh, just the way of life, the way you would have to live. I mean, there was no wetting water, there was no electricity, there was no um, obviously no bathrooms. Uh, learning how to uh, adjust to taking a bucket bath, which we called a bucket bath. You start out with, I started out, I think with two gallons of water maybe, and got it down to where I could do it in a half a gallon. I mean, that's when you got really good at it. But while I was there, I was able to, uh, there was a barrel that I bought and I had them send me a, water a piece of water hose and a head to a shower that I could fit into that water hose and um with the help of my houseboy and and uh one of the priests over at the uh church we I built myself a shower um where I could catch the rainwater it would go into that barrel and we fit the hose in there I could bring it down, the gravity would push it down and through the head of the shower. And so that that turned out, I did that fairly quickly after I moved into the village, like within six, seven months. So we had our own little community. Sierra Leone was about the size of the state of South Carolina. And there were about 200 Peace Corps volunteers in that country. And word got out that I had a shower and I, like I said, I was a mile off the main highway. So I had lots of visitors stopping by just so they could take a shower and all <laughs> that. So, person. <laughs> so that was a big thing because you wanted to see, it didn't matter who they were, <laughs> they yeah. were American and could speak English. So most of the Peace Corps volunteers were very educated, very smart people. Um, we had a great library in the country that we exchanged. Nobody ever took a book home. They left it in the country for the library so for other volunteers to, to be able to read. So we read a lot. I read a ton while I was there. Um, you would get up and you would have objectives and jobs you wanted to get done. But in that culture, you, you were in what we called Sierra Leone time. And that may mean two o'clock tomorrow, or it may mean two o'clock a week from now, that same day. I mean, they did things whenever they got ready. So uh, I lived in a tribe called the Mende. The Mende tribe had the reputation of being lazy people. The Timbi tribe had the uh, reputation of being stealers or thieving, 
is what they call it. So anything over there that wasn't on you uh, was free game as far as, as the Sierra Leoneans were concerned. And even if you, one time I left my window open in, uh, and I had windows, most people don't. Uh, but I lived in the back of the chief's house that a concrete floor had a zinc pan roof and it had um, actual windows you could open up. No screens, but you know you could open up the window similar to what you'd see at a beach house. Mm -hmm. So I had the window open in my bedroom and I had my, um, uh, well, it was a little thing that they, uh, that I had, had uh, made for me over there to where it made it hard to steal, where you had to pull it up and, and to get the money out and stuff. It was just a little, a leather type gadget that was, it was a cross uh, body fit. And they took a pole in and, and got that and got the money out of it uh, from your house. I mean, it was just like in broad daylight too. It didn't matter because it was, it, it was where they could get to it. They were going to steal it. So, so that Timby Brunch had that reputation of being teeth, teethers is what they called it. Um, but it, it was, there was the saying, and I guess you still hear it sometimes, they talk about the Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. And that was really so true because it was hard to just survive, let alone get anything done. But then it was every morning you got up, you learned something new. There was something different you would come across. And it was a, it was a great learning experience. Um, so, I mean, it was a really a, a, a true statement, toughest job you'll ever love. And we had a lot, of, a lot of fun, even though it sounds like a horrible living condition, and it was. But it was, um, I met a lot of great people, a lot of uh, interesting people. Um, you know, some of them, one of them went on to be a, a U.S. Senator from California. Um, one of them ended up being, and still is, uh, in the hierarchy of the Peace Corps organization out of Washington, D.C. So I was in there with some interesting individuals. And, and uh, in that village where the church was, which I said was about an hour or a mile and a half away, um, was a Peace Corps volunteer that was, had been there five years. Five years was a maximum you could stay. And she was in her um, fourth and fifth year when I was there. You sign up for two years, you can re-up one time for either a year or two years, and then you can re-up one more time, but you can only stay one year. So she had been there five years. She was um, from uh, Michigan. She had um, gone over as an ag, um, volunteer to help teach them um, a different way to, to raise their rice and get a bigger production from the rice. But she ended up building her, with the help of her and this priest, they literally built a high school in that um, village. So the students could go to the primary school and then if they could test high enough to get into the high school, they could go on to high school there. And then if they tested high enough out of high school, they could go on and get some type of college, which very few of them are able to do that. Um, number one, are able to test that high and number two, to pay for it, uh, the college. But, but they, they built, a pretty impressive school and had some, some um, most of the teachers. There were maybe one or two Africans that taught in the school, but the rest of them were the priest and, and either um, Peace Corps volunteers or uh, the Canadian volunteers or what they call VICA, was, which was a uh, volunteer Catholic organization that also sent um, people over. So. So they had some good instructors there and, and they were doing things like trying to raise rabbits as a source of protein uh, in the country. And they were trying a lot of different things to try to help 
bring protein into their diet because other than what little fish they had, they really had no protein in their diets. It was mainly um, rice and, and what uh, they call a uh, cassava plant, which is kind of like greens. Uh, for us, it's what it sort of looked like. Um, so they were trying to help get protein into their their diet, um, which some of us contend that that was one of the reasons that that hurt them academically is that they had not had enough protein and amino acids as they were growing and uh, able in order for them to develop properly. So, so they did a lot of those kinds of things. And uh, I can't imagine being there or staying in that country five years, but I think she would have stayed forever if she could have. Uh, that's how well some people adapt to it. And then others are, you know, they are, they can't, they won't last six months to their wanting to go home. So there's a few of those that are also, like I said, a few that just had to be cycled backed out because they um, didn't listen to the people that were trying to tell them what they needed to do. And then, um, and then there's some that, you know, went to work there to stay there two years and, and leaves, which is what the majority of us did. Is there a reason that they only let you stay five years and that you can't stay longer if you want? I never did ask because um, I knew I wasn't going to be there five years. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what the rationale was as to why they, what the five year deal was, but I'm sure there was one. There was rationale around everything. Um, in that country there, uh, that the movie Blood Diamond was um, that whole story is around Sierra Leone. That was one of their big, I mean, that's what uh, one of their big, um, not really money makers, it was money maker for some people, but not for Sierra Leoneans, but they mined diamonds in that country. And um, right before I got there, uh, the Maurice Templeton, he was, um, Jackie Onassis's uh, boyfriend until she died actually or companion or whatever you want to call it and he owned a diamond company so his his company had a big operation in Sierra Leone and about two months or so before we got there um, John Kennedy Jr. was over in the country and in one of the bars where a lot of us went to meet up in every little town, there was like a gathering place that if you were in that town, you would go to that place. And if there was any Peace Corps people in town at the time, they would either be there or come through there or the owner would, would know if who was in town and who wasn't. So you could track them down. I mean, that's how hungry you were to get to, to be with another uh, American. But uh, yeah, there was a picture on the wall of him pissing in a um, ditch when he was over there, right across the street from that place, and they had it on the wall over there. But anyway, uh, I became good friends with the guy that is a Canadian that uh, ran that company for Maurice Templeton. Um, so that was, I mean, you met a lot of neat people like that. That was. I mean, you would have never dreamed of being a third world country mining diamonds, but but that's where they come from. So. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, but that kind of your, that movie, your Blood Diamond, was was um, it wasn't filmed in that country, but it was uh, some of the scenes where they're at the bar, the tiki bar, and some of that. It looks very much like that country did. Yeah. 